To discuss the evolution of this critical relationship, we welcome Saurabh Gupta. He is a resident senior fellow at the Institute for China America Studies. Also with us, John Gong is a professor of economics at the University of International Business and Economics from Philadelphia. Nason Mabubi is a research scholar at the Center for the Study of Contemporary China at the University of Pennsylvania. And joining us from Beijing is Thomas Gale. He is the CEO of the Wharton Education Group. Welcome to all of you. John Gong, let's start here in the studio. The United States dispute with China is often framed as a trade war. Uh, but is there more to this? Is it, as some analysts believe, uh, an attempt to contain a rising China? I think there's certainly elements to that. I think uh, there are people around uh, President Trump that really believe in this theory. I think even behind this trade war, there is a um, a concerted effort trying to at least bring these jobs back to the U.S., uh, trying to move uh, or drive corporate market operating in China, moving out of China at least. Uh, that's one theory. But there's another theory is that, as you said, it's, it's about ch containing China, at least on the technology front. The United States is very concerned that the, uh, the China's technology progress is starting to threaten the United States' uh, supremacy, especially in defense technologies. So these are the you know, issues that, that are in a broader picture, more than just uh, the trade war itself. Right, and John, uh, at the moment, the United States is the dominant power. I mean, if you look at it economically, technologically, mm -hmm. uh, in terms of defense as well, is the feeling that the United States wants to maintain that position? Oh, there's no doubt about this. I mean, it's always been United States' position to absolutely dominant in, in that space. For example, you know, when Soviet Union was very getting close to uh, the United States, there was this splenic moment, you know, when they first uh, launched the satellite, the United States, you know, immediately got into action and, uh, you know, initiated a huge program on those uh, development of these technologies. So there's no doubt about this. The United States always wants to maintain a technology, technological edge, um, and, and, and especially in defense technologies. So, uh, uh, this dispute has also been characterized as a clash of civilizations. As we heard in our report a moment ago, a top U.S. State Department official says this is really a fight with a different civilization and a different ideology. Is it a clash of civilizations? No, it is not a clash of civilizations. I can give some, I, I can understand a little bit as to where she's coming from out here when there is great power competition you have identity and culture necessarily thrown into that, into that mix. And so from that perspective, if the U.S. sees that the, it is in great power competition with China, as it has said in its, in its national security strategy, and in fact, even in the Indo-Pacific military strategy, which just came out at the beginning of this month, where it called China a revisionist power, which is very strong language, frankly, but of course didn't endow the tools to the U.S. government if it really is a revisionist power to, mm. to, 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 to have a real strategy to deal with that. But frankly, no, this is not a clash of civilizations. And this is what I'll say in this regard. You know, Henry Kissinger had this very beautiful little quip in the 70s. He said, in terms of the battle of the sexes, there is going to be no winner in the battle of the sexes because there's too much fraternization between the sexes. Same way, there's too much fraternization between U.S. and China for them to become real enemies and to have thereafter this clash of civilization. I want to add a note that uh, what uh, Karen Skinner said is more than a clash of civilization. She also said, I mean, if you look at a clash of civilizations, civilizations mostly defined, in my opinion, based on the religious beliefs. I mean, look at different ways of the, you know, the, the classified the, the, the entire world is mostly based on religion. But what Skinner said is more than that. She also said this is the first time that this is a fight outside the, the Caucasian family. That yes. means that uh, it's, she brings in also the racial angle. It's a angle. race issue, yeah. It's a racial angle as well. That's very, very surprising and shocking to me when a U.S. politician says something like this. <clears throat> right. Let me bring in Nason Mabubi. Uh, yeah. Nason, uh, there was a piece, an opinion piece in the Financial Times by its very well-known commentator, Martin Wolf, in which he said that the disappearance of the Soviet Union or with the disappearance of the Soviet Union, the United States has chosen China as the new threat. Trump casts uh, China as an economic, military, even an ideological enemy, when in fact it's not an enemy. So has the U United States felt that it's necessary here to manufacture an enemy? So let me make a few points also addressing some of the comments that have been made so far. 
The first thing that I think I want to emphasize is that it's important to distinguish between the Trump administration and some of the particular people, including Kieran Skinner, who are associated with the Trump administration, and then more broadly, the community of business interests, academics, NGOs, uh, military, who follow China and think about the relationship between the US and China. And that's a distinction that's, I think, important because there isn't always and has not always historically been convergence in all the views across the board, across all those different constituencies and across the particular administration in power at the time. This particular moment is interesting in that there is a broad consensus of concern about China amongst all those different constituencies. And the Trump administration does have its own concerns as well. But if we dig deeper, we'll see that there's a lot of differences still embedded within it. So for example, the Kieran Skinner comment that I agree had some racial overtones to it was immediately denounced by very many people in the business community, in the former government officials, amongst academics who follow China. And I don't think in any way should be understood to be the dominant perspective among US China watchers. She said it, and she is currently the head of the policy planning staff. But again, I don't think that that's a common view within the US China watching community across all those different constituencies. And the second point that I want to emphasize is that US policymaking towards China is not as coherent and uh, planned in advance as sometimes the current analysis seems to suggest. All those different constituencies that I mentioned have different types of concerns about China, but I don't think that they coalesce into some kind of systematic, clear, clean-cut plan vis-a-vis -vis China that analysis like what you just suggested by Martin Wolf writing in the Financial Times would imply. But is there a feeling, uh, Nation, here in the United States that it has to portray uh, China as a foe, as an enemy? That's one way of galvanizing the people behind you. I do think that there are certain people, amongst them Steve Bannon, President Trump's uh, former advisor, maybe current advisor in some ways, who are taking this particular moment where there's heightened tensions between the US and China and heightened concerns amongst these different constituencies to inject this very uh, dramatic Cold War era language yeah. into the rhetorical sphere. I don't think that it's fair to take that language and associate it with all the different types of constituencies in the US who follow China and have their own concerns about China. Thomas Gale, what is your view on this, on the uh, changing views on China, on the changing language on China as well? I mean, portraying China as a foe. Um, yeah, I, I really think that it is overblown on both sides of the, of the ocean. I've been fortunate enough to work in China for over 25 years. I've lived here for the past three years. Um, I think that some of the um, conversations that are going on are meant to be somewhat inflammatory on, on both sides. China is doing it now with their um, uh, public on giving the warnings against travel to the U.S., against students. Um, um, trying to enroll in U.S. universities. Um, travel is down for the first time to, uh, to the United States from China since 2003. So I think that there's some fear-mongering going on on both sides. I don't think it's at all the reality, as the previous commentators had, uh, had pointed out. And I think that, again, the Chinese and American people are very, very similar in many, many ways. I think the, the governments are obviously very dissimilar in very many ways. So that therein lies the problem in getting to the resolution of the trade war and then also going to these other somewhat Cold War tactics, which really are uh, unnecessary. Uh, just on the point of students coming to the United States, I mean, some of the restrictions have, we've had calls for restrictions here in the United States. They haven't been coming from China. Absolutely. I mean, it, the, the uh, present uh, executive branch has tightened many of the um, visa requirements. They've gone from the 10-year student visa to a one-year student visa, so it has to be renewed continuously. Um, it, it does make it more difficult, and I think that's unfortunate because I think the um, international students, particularly the Chinese students, bring a very high caliber student to the American system, plus they're really funding uh, much of the American universities. Um, up to 30 percent of many universities um, receive uh, their funding from 
uh, Chinese students. So I think that it's not a good policy by the administration to try to discourage um, students coming. Just recently, though, a week ago, um, the Chinese government issued a, a warning, security warning, to mm -hmm. students, um, advising them for both safety as well as the um, heightened dis uh, difficulty in, um, in obtaining their visas, as well as warning them that upon uh, graduation, that um, obtaining a visa to work in the United States may be um, harder for them to come by. Yeah. So all these things uh, may or may not take, take their impact on the Chinese students. We still have the highest number of Chinese students ever um, this past year, and I hope that continues. Right, and I think that warning from the Chinese government was actually directed at the high number of shootings that we see here in the United States. Uh, John Gong, before we move on to something else, uh, just getting back to this talk of a different civilization, I mean, didn't the United States experience a similar thing in its dispute with Japan several decades ago? Yes. Um, well, there's this theory that as, long, as soon as uh, another economy grows to something like 60% of the U.S. size, uh, the United States is going to take action. It happened with respect to Russia. It happened with Soviet Union at the time. It happened with respect to Japan. Um, and, and this is, uh, you know, wrong over again. Um, but, uh, you know, I would point out that, uh, you, know, uh, you know, China is very different. It's, it's a different country from, uh, from Japan in, in, from a political perspective. Um, and that, uh, you know, Chinese government is not going to do the same kind of things the Chinese government committed to do last time. So I think some of these people, you know, uh, in the current Trump administration, they used to work in, the, uh, in dealing with Japan at that time. For example, uh, Leiheiser, Robert Leiheiser, was the uh, assistant USTR last, last time. And he's probably using the same kind of tactics. But I think you know, he has to keep in mind that uh, this is a different country he's dealing with. Ideologically, they're bedfellows, aren't they? Yeah, well, that's another reason. Right? Yeah. <clears throat> so, Rob, I want to move on to something else. Uh, the South China Sea, that's been a source of tensions between these two countries. Uh, this is how both sides see the issue. First, we have the Chinese Defense Minister and then the U.S. Acting Defense Secretary. Let's watch this. Who is threatening security and stability in the South China Sea? 100,000 ships sail through every year. None has been threatened. The problem, however, is in recent years, countries outside the region come to the South China Sea to flex their muscles in the name of freedom of navigation. They argue that it's defensive. It looks like it's a bit overkill. I mean, surface-to-air missiles, long runways, I mean, seems excessive. How much of a flashpoint is this? I frankly don't think it is such a big flashpoint at this point okay. of time, considering how much attention is paid to it. It will remain a flashpoint, there's no question about it. But the essence of it becoming a flashpoint is if there is a really disgruntled claimant state at a given point of time, which then wants to st stand on the US's shoulder and then take its quarrel to China and have the United States also back it up. We saw this to some extent during uh, President Aquino's reign uh, in, uh, of the Philippines. And at that point of time, tension spiraled over. And of course, there was the arbitration case going, going on at that point of time. Freedom of navigation is essentially assured in the South China Sea. What the U.S. talks about are excessive claims in the South China right. Sea, and it has its own excessive claims in the Pacific also, in the mid-Pacific, separate issue. But the point is that this will become an active issue if there is denial of navigation or if the Chinese or any of the claimant states get into some sort of a hot conflict at right. which point of time the U.S. gets engaged as an ally. But those alliance obligations are written so vaguely right. that also makes it difficult for the U.S., even if it wanted to, to get involved. So at this point of time, it's more... Yeah. Could it also be a question of perception here, Sarah? Because, uh, I mean, does this give ammunition, so to speak, to those hardliners in the Trump administration who don't want to see relations with China improve? Yes, it does, because this is a continuous issue. It's been there for a very long period of time. But yeah. what I would say is 
that if they really wanted ammunition and they were actually moving in that direction, it is the Taiwan Straits, which is the much That's more right. much more dangerous, uh, right. dangerous, dangerous waterway. Mm -hmm. Because we're not talking, we, again, the alliance obligations that, uh, that are written out are written very hazily, the Taiwan Relations Act, so it does not have anything obligatory involved right. in terms of the U.S. coming to its support. But we're, what we're talking about out here, Taiwan, it's not just a piece of small real estate. There are actual people. There are millions of people involved yeah. out there. And this is a core interest for the Chinese. So that is a real flashpoint. And that's the reason we've been seeing some of this, of this tension gravitating to the, to the Taiwan states because the U.S. has right. brought that issue up to the fore. John, I'll get to you in a moment. Nathan, you want to say something on this? Yeah, I agree with a number of the points that were just made. Uh, first of all, that it was a bigger flashpoint uh, earlier, maybe towards the end of the Obama administration in particular. It seemed as if that was one of the major flashpoints in the relationship. And it's interesting intellectually to see how it has become less of a flashpoint compared to other areas of the relationship, including, of course, trade. I do think the tension in the South China Sea will largely be dictated by the other Asian countries uh, mm -hmm. that are surrounding uh, the situation alongside China, and the U.S. will maybe be secondary to that. Right. But then thirdly, I really do want to emphasize my agreement that at the moment, Taiwan and the potential for military action in Taiwan and the U.S. response is much more of a <laughs> flashpoint than anything we might have to say about the South China Sea right now. All right, John, go ahead. Yeah, I totally agree with that. I think the problem with the Taiwan issue is that, you know, as you said, there are people who in the United States government who don't want to see a, you know, improved relationship between China and U.S. and they're using the, the Taiwan as sort of a car that it can play with and they want to maintain sort of a, 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 a tension there. Um, and and the, the danger of this kind of approach is that it's not just on the United States. There are actually people in China who want to seize this kind of opportunity to introduce a final solution for Taiwan. You know, you know what I'm talking about. So, so this has the danger of blowing out of control, the spin out of control, that it's exact opposite of what those people in the United States government is planning for. I don't think they understand that. I don't think they have that scenario in mind that this China is different you know, 30, 40 years ago right. than from today. And if you want to play this car, you better plan for the worst scenario. Otherwise, it's just playing with fire, you know. <clears throat> Thomas Gell, I want to look at the trade and economic relationship between the two countries. I mean, these are the two biggest economies in the world. The economies, to a large extent, are intertwined. Uh, I mean, one of, the, one of the companies that's been in the news a lot recently is Huawei. The Trump administration uh, doesn't want to do business with Huawei. It's encouraging its allies not to do business with Huawei. And I'm wondering if we could get to a situation where we could see one part of the world, like we had in the first Cold War, where one part of the world stands behind China and decides it's going to be continuing to do business with China, business as usual, and another side of the world which is going to stand behind the United States. Well, I think that that's a distinct possibility because it is, um, the technology is so um, advanced and, and Huawei has done a, done a fantastic job in developing uh, cutting edge technology and the United States is, is behind. The, the economies are forever embra embraced with one another. So mm -hmm. there can't be a separation. I think that the Trump administration right now is just trying to reset the board to a certain extent. There have been years of intellectual property um, issues, a mm -hmm. um, $375 billion trade imbalance, which is sucking cash out of the United States into China. So these are things that they're trying to find a way to um, um, put back on a more even keel. So I think it's extreme measures, um, but that is more of the business acumen yeah. of the President Trump's administration than on a normal political um, uh, parlance. But Thomas, uh, Gail, do you also think there is a recognition in the United States that if the Trump administration goes after companies like Huawei, tries to cripple them, try to trust to put them out of business, and we saw what happened with the other Chinese company, ZTE, that at some stage this is going to start hurting American companies as well. Oh, it already does. Um, I mean, obviously, we're supplying the chips for it. There are mm -hmm. substantial losses um, throughout the, the tech world on it. Um, like I say, there are some, you know, legitimate concerns on intellectual property theft and, and other areas, which I think Huawei has, has been addressing, and I think the, the satisfaction of many people, but obviously not to the satisfaction of the administration yet. So I think that though we did just see 
a two-year extension of some of the um, bans that were going to be put in place. So yeah. instead of um, some of the uh, bans being put in in two years, the White House has um, recommended that they be extended to four years. And I think these time periods are to allow things to work out before they would actually go into effect. Right. Um, you know, as we saw the uh, Mexican um, tariffs come off relatively quickly, I think that there, as long as there's action, good action on both sides, we can have a resolution to all of these issues. Ness, in another point of dispute between the two countries, I mean, a big complaint that's made against China is that it's been violating uh, WTO rules, World Trade Organization rules. Um, but hasn't the U.S. also been violating WTO rules with these tariffs and its attempts to block the uh, appointment of judges uh, who sit uh, to resolve disputes? Well, so there is a consensus, I think, among uh, watchers of uh, China's behavior in the WTO that when WTO rules serve China's purposes, uh, China is a very good actor within the WTO system, and, and when they don't, it's not. Um, on the U.S. side, I think uh, going back to the Obama administration, many people who pay attention to the WTO were concerned about the Obama administration's uh, actions vis-a-vis -vis appointments of judges. And uh, of course, you can make an argument that the particular uh, mechanism of tariffs that the Trump administration has been deploying are problematic from a WTO perspective. The larger perspective that I think is bigger than all of these particular points is that the WTO system really does need reform. And the interesting question is whether the US and China will approach it uh, cooperatively as yeah. countries that on the whole benefit from the international system and from the WTO in particular, or whether they want to tear it down uh, and replace it with who knows what. And that, I think, is much bigger uh, than whether the U.S. violated with the tariffs or whether China has not been playing by the rules uh, in, in, in the last few years. So, uh, uh, talking about the WTO, this, of course, raises the broader question of um, you know, what we sometimes call the rules-based multilateral order. Are we seeing the slow destruction of that? I mean, the irony of it is that a lot of that was built by the United States and its allies in the aftermath of World War II. Yes, I, I, I do feel we are seeing the destruction of that order, and it's difficult for other people to really step in and, 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 and find an alternative to the order or to sort of uh, uphold, that, uphold that very system. Mm -hmm. U.S. wants to do bilateral deals and yeah. bilateral relationships so it can use whatever leverage it has, and it will have dispute settlement rules within that between the two parties, but it will not submit itself for third-party arbitration. And here's where the damage has happened, even in terms of the trade negotiations. Yeah. The two sides have made tremendous progress, and many of what was thought to be the hard issues were resolved. Mm -hmm. It's been the forced technology transfer issue has basically been resolved. The one which people thought would never happen would, was on disciplines or transparency on Chinese industrial subsidies. That has to be been resolved with the satisfaction of the Americans. The issue right now is with regard to enforcing these commitments. Right, right, right. And the important and the point was that oh China is not willing to put many of these in terms of domestic law. Yeah. But think of it this way. What if these commitments were enforced by a third party or body? I mean, then China's commitments, whatever was written down in paper, whether it was in form of laws or regulations, yeah. would be enforced a third, by a third party. But that cannot happen with the, because the US will not submit its own obligations and commitments, as well as China's submit commitments to mm. be, be adjudicated at yeah. a third body. And so the enforceability issue then has, is now up in, up in the air. And so this has caused damage, and it, from as you asked initially, from a long-term perspective, because really yeah. this rules-based order is going to be the victim. John Gong, one final question. Mm -hmm. There was a headline in the opinion section of the New York Times uh, this past weekend, uh, and the headline said, is it too late to stop a new Cold War with China? Um, I think it's not too late. I think at least this meeting is going to take place between President Trump and President Xi on June 28th in Osaka, Japan. Yeah. I think they still both claim the, the other side is their good friend. Uh, so I think uh, there's still some opportunity of uh, reaching an agreement. Um, and, and, and in my opinion, this agreement about the trade deal really buys time for both sides to sort of coexist in a peaceful way for a couple of years. And yeah. hopefully, uh, as we move along, the kind of structural issues, the kind of geopolitical issues will probably go away as the, uh, the power structures of both sides start to uh, change a little bit. All right. And we have to leave it there. Thanks to all of you for being with us.
That's all for this edition of The Heat, but you can listen to more in our podcast. We'll be covering stories from around the world in a bit more personal and candid manner with our guests and correspondents. And the conversation also continues online. Chat with us about this or any other show on Twitter. We're at CGTN America. Or visit us on Facebook. That's facebook.com slash CGTN America. I'm Arnold Naidu in Washington, D.C. Thanks for watching.